Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious studies revision video. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are continuing our look at religious language with a look at the verification principle, the falsification principle and with a look at Wittgenstein's language games, which is one of my all time favourite topics on the course. So in the previous video, we had a look at the apophatic way and the cataphatic way with a focus on Aquinas's views on analogy and Tillich's views on symbol. And we are going to continue looking at religious language today by looking, as I say, at the verification principle, the falsification principle, which are, of course, two challenges to the meaningfulness of religious language. And then we'll be looking at the religious responses to those challenges. So how did Hick, for example, defend the meaningfulness of religious language in the face of that challenge from the verification principle. And he did so, of course, by saying that verification doesn't just have to take place in this lifetime, but that actually religious statements, religious truth claims could be verified eschatologically after death. And we'll be looking at Hare's idea of us having blicks, for example, which is an explanation for the religious beliefs that we hold. And then, as I say, we'll also be looking at Ludwig Wittgenstein and his idea of language games, that we all operate within forms of life and that it's really important that we consider context when we are critiquing, assessing and making judgments about the meaningfulness of language. And, you know, the conclusion there is going to be that religious language, religious statements are meaningful for those who belong to a religious form of life and play by the rules of the theistic language game. And so somebody outside of that language game, for example, somebody who's an atheist, can't come along and critique and say that, you know, religious statements are not meaningful because they're not playing by the rules of the game. They're not within the game. So they're not in a position to make that judgment about the meaningfulness of the language being used by players within the game. So we've got a lot to talk about today, a really fascinating topic. And in this video, we will cover everything you need to know for an A star if we do get asked about these key ideas in the exam. So as we did last time in our first video on religious language, I just wanted to introduce you to some of the key scholars we'll be talking about today, because remember, in order to secure that A star, it is essential that your arguments are grounded in scholars and what they have said. You know, please make sure every paragraph has got a reference to a scholar, to a text, to a source of wisdom and authority. So we'll be looking at Wittgenstein today and his idea of language games. We'll also be meeting A.J. Eyre, who is a, a key logical positivist who is uh, very, very passionate about the verification principle and why that shows religious statements would be meaningless. We'll be meeting again St. Thomas Aquinas, remember our 13th century doctor of the church. Paul Tillich, we had a look at last time when we looked at symbol, and we'll be making some links and connections uh, between what he said and what Wittgenstein says, for example. We'll also be meeting Karl Popper, very important when we're talking about the falsification principle, and R.M. Hare, very important when we talk about Blix and his explanation for the meaningfulness of religious beliefs to those who hold them or for those who hold them. And then I hope you remember Maimonides when we were talking about the apophatic way, the via negativa in the previous video. But yes, as I say, you know, for every single topic, and I'm not just talking about religious language here, but I'm talking about every topic on the course, please make sure you know your scholars. Please be thinking, which scholars would I use in an essay on this topic? Whether that topic is religious language, natural moral law, religious experiences, or the design argument, for example. Remember, at A level, it is essential that we are referring to our scholars in order to secure those top marks. I also want to remind you of the keywords for religious language. We're going to talk about a lot of these today. So logical positivism, really important because it is the philosophical approach taken by a group of philosophers known as the Vienna Circle, very creatively named because they were based in Vienna um, and they met in Vienna in the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s. And they believed, they decided that theological language, so any religious statements, anything where someone 
ones talking about God, for example, saying that God is love, they decided that is meaningless because it is neither a matter of logic. So it's not true by definition or, you know, it's not true a priori and it's not provable by empirical evidence. So it's not true a posteriori either. Um, and so they devised this verification principle. So this is the idea that statements are only meaningful if they are true by definition. So they're a tautology, for example, you know, that all triangles have three sides, all that all bachelors are men, or it's empirically verifiable. And whenever you hear that phrase, I want you to imagine a scientist in a science lab doing an experiment and testing a hypothesis, because saying that something is empirically verifiable means that you can check, you can test whether it is true or false through observation, through testing, and by using your senses. Because remember, empiricism is the idea that we acquire knowledge, we gain knowledge through our senses, through experience. So empirically verifiable just means that you could test and you could find out whether that statement is true or false via your senses. You could use your senses, for example, a scientist, you know, measuring things in a science lab in order to check if it's true or false. And of course, things like God is love would be seen as failing to meet the criteria for verification because you can't see that directly for yourself. Although, of course, Hicks' response is going to be with eschatological verification that you will see that after death when you're in heaven. But more on that to come. But you just also need to know that there are strong and weak forms of the verification principle. And we're going to look at those today. The next key word is cognitive and a cognitive statement is a statement that conveys factual information. So it is something that you can check whether it's true or false. For example, that um, A-level results day is in August. That would be a cognitive statement because I can then go and look in the diary, check the calendar and see whether that is the case. Now, most cognitive statements are synthetic and that means that they are shown to be true or false depending upon experience. So, you know, we can see it for ourselves. So, for example, you know, if I said the sun will set tonight at 8.34. I could then actually go and, you know, sit on a hill and actually watch the sun setting and then, you know, check and write down exactly what time that happened. So it's a cognitive statement because I can then go and check it. A non-cognitive statement, on the other hand, is one that can't be checked for whether it's factual or not, because it's a matter of opinion or it's an emotion. So it's subjective. It's not something that we can objectively say is true or false. It is something that is just a matter of personal opinion. And so non-cognitive language is language, obviously, that can't therefore be um, empirically verified as true or false. The falsification principle then seeks to do the same thing as the verification principle in that it's seeking to establish whereas uh, whether sorry a statement is meaningful, but it takes the opposite approach because with the falsification principle, you are saying that a statement is factually significant and meaningful if there is evidence which could falsify it. So with the falsification principle, it's about being prepared to say what would prove that statement to be wrong. So whereas obviously when you want to verify something, you're going out of your way to test whether it's true. Whereas the falsification principle is about setting out and being able to say what what would show that statement to be false? And the key criticism of religious language and uh, theism is that religious believers always seek to qualify their beliefs rather than falsify them. They move the goalposts. And we're going to look at the uh, parable of the gardener as we look at that today. Our next key term then is the uh, eschatological verification, sorry, I only skipped one then. Uh, and that is, as I mentioned before, Hicks view that the facts or the truth claims made by the Christian religion will be verified or falsified at death or after death. So he, you know, says that that verification doesn't just need to take place in this world. It could actually take place in the next world, in the next life. And that's his way of defending the meaningfulness of religious statements. And he uses his parable of the uh, travellers going to the celestial city in order to explain that. And we will come on to that today. A blick then is Hare's idea of a framework of interpretation. It is a view of the world that we have that develops from birth. It develops as we age and as we grow and it is fixed in our minds. It's like a lens through which we see the world. So someone might have a Christian blick. He uses the example of the uh, lunatics blick at university. And we'll look at that example today. And he is saying that these are non-cognitive and non-falsifiable. 
So this is his way of explaining religious beliefs and how religious claims can have meaning for those who are religious. We'll also look at language games, which is, of course, Wittgenstein's idea that language has meaning within a particular social context. With each context, context, I'm making up words now, excuse me, each context being governed by these particular rules. Um, so it's this idea that in the same way that when you're playing football, you play by certain rules and when you play rugby, you play by certain rules in every area of our lives, which Wittgenstein calls our forms of life, we are playing by different rules. And so language has meaning within that particular game. Um, and so the meaning of a statement is not defined by the steps you take to verify or falsify it, but by the context in which it occurs. So use and context govern meaning. So as I say, this is how uh, religious language can be meaningful for those who are religious, who belong to a religious form of life and play by the rules of the theistic language game and so it would be wrong for somebody outside of that game to come along and say that claim is meaningless the statement you've made is meaningless because it is meaningful to those who have used it as I say within that form of life whilst they play by the rules of that game a little bit like someone who's an expert on rugby coming along to a tennis match and saying you're playing it wrong you know, they're trying to apply the rules of rugby to a tennis match, which you can't do because they're two separate games. Um, and as I say, you know, this is a way of saying that religious language can be meaningful for those who are religious and who play by the rules of that theistic language game. Uh, quite a nice link there as well to the non-overlapping magisteria as well, which is uh, associated with Alistair McGrath and the idea that, you know, religion and science are doing two separate things and they're actually compatible with each other because, you know, they're not overlapping. They're not in conflict. They're not in competition. They're two different forms of life, two different language games, if you like. Uh, an analogy which we looked at last time is an attempt to explain the meaning of something which is difficult to understand or that transcends our world and our understanding by comparing it with something that is more securely within our frame of reference. And of course, we looked at Aquinas' two examples of proper proportion and attribution. The apophatic way then, also known as the via negativa, is the denial of any positive descriptions of God. So it's the idea you can't speak positively about God. You can only say what God is not, for example, rather than speaking in positive terms about him. And remember, that is about avoiding anthropomorphism and preserving the transcendence of God. It's seen as a respectful approach. But of course, it's not the approach most religious people use today. They do use the cataphatic way, the via positiva, which is the idea that we can talk about God in positive positive terms. So, for example, we can say that God is love. Uh, and the two examples that we looked at in the previous video were, of course, analogy and the symbols, um, which is from Paul Tillich. And we looked at that distinction between a sign and a symbol, didn't we? And how symbolic language allows you to, um, you know, connect with it on a deeper level. It unlocks the door and it allows us to, um, you know, develop our, in this case, religious belief. So now that we've had a look at those key terms, I want to just go back over this key distinction between cognitive and non-cognitive language, because this is very helpful for us today. So language is cognitive if it conveys factual information. So if it is making a truth claim, that can be empirically verified. So, for example, the Houses of Parliament are located in Westminster. That's not an opinion, is it? That's not an emotion. That's not a preference. That is being stated as a fact. And I can check that by getting on the tube, heading to Westminster and seeing if the Houses of Parliament are actually there. So, you know, a cognitive statement is a statement that can be shown to be true or false, depending on empirical observation and therefore evidence. Whereas uh, language would be non-cognitive if it doesn't seek to convey factual information. So if it instead seeks to convey an emotion or give an order, so it's prescriptive, make a moral claim uh, or express a wish. So, for example, I don't like it when people steal. I'm expressing there a personal opinion, aren't I? You're not going to go off then and test whether it's true or false. You're going to take my word for it because I'm not seeking to make a factual claim. I'm expressing, in this case, a personal opinion, a feeling, an emotion about something. So really important distinction between cognitive statements, which are factual claims, and non-cognitive statements, which are not factual claims. So just to make sure that we've got our, you know, secure understanding of this, here are a couple on the screen uh, and have a go at sorting them out. Are they cognitive or non-cognitive? So 
Obviously, the ones in green there are your cognitive statements that Wembley Park is on the Met line because I can go and check a tube map and see if that is the case. A-level results day is in August. And again, I can go and check if that's the case by having a look at the calendar. And then water boils at 10 degrees. Obviously, that's not a correct statement, but it's still a cognitive statement because it's something that I can go and empirically check. Whereas do not kill, for example, is a moral claim, isn't it? It's prescriptive in terms of making a moral judgment judgment, but it's not something I can empirically verify. There are mixed opinions on it. There's no definitive answer. Do not kill. You know, in different situations, people might have different opinions. If we think about just war theory, for example, God is all loving. Again, that's not something that I can empirically verify, is it? Uh, it's a belief that religious people hold based on what they read in the Bible. Uh, and then sunsets are beautiful to see. Again, that's an opinion, isn't it? That's not something we're going to go and test in the science lab. It's something where people are giving an opinion even if you did a poll I don't think 100% of people would agree they wouldn't say yes I agree it's a personal opinion so it's a non-cognitive statement okay so let's have a look at our first key topic today which is the verification principle and the main man we need to know about, looking very smart here in his uh, suit jacket and his tie with his waistcoat on, is A.J. Eyre. Now, he was a British atheist philosopher who, you know, was very influential in the 20th century. So he was born in 1910 and he died in 1989. So, you know, really anchored in the 20th century there. He was an empiricist, an emotivist and a logical positivist. Now, emotivism, you'll know from metaethics, the idea that all moral judgments and all moral statements are just personal opinions. They are matters uh, where people are expressing an emotion. They're expressing a feeling. So there is no objective right or wrong. All morality is just a matter of personal opinion and it's expressed as an emotion. Now, he was very, very successful in terms of his uh, academic studies and then in terms of his philosophical career because he wrote language truth and logic age just 24 so you know as you can see there very young when he became active as an academic he developed and this is why he's important a version of the verification principle for verifying whether statements are meaningful and the key question really with the whole of religious language is are religious statements meaningful is religious language meaningful and he developed the verification principle as this test as this way of verifying whether statements are meaningful or not. So let's, you know, unpack this a bit more. So we have to understand him in context, and Wittgenstein would be very happy about that. And we have to understand this idea of logical positivism, because he was an important part of this. So this group, this ideology, if you like, originated from the Vienna Circle in the early 20th century. And remember, this was a group of philosophers who got together in the 1920s and 30s to discuss and to philosophize. And um, they developed this idea of uh, logical positivism. It was later called logical empiricism, which might help you to grasp this idea and understand it a little bit more. But in a nutshell, the idea of logical positivism is that for a statement to be meaningful, it has to be verifiable. So all meaningful statements are verifiable. And there are two ways you can do that. There are two ways that you can verify. We can call it a two pronged criteria. The first one is if it is analytic. So it's true a priori. So it's true by definition. And if something's true by definition, we'd call it a tautology. And our example of this is that a triangle has three sides. So that is true by definition because the word itself uh, contains the definition triangle. Tri means free, angle means angle, free angle. So a triangle always has free angles. It is true by definition. So that is an analytic statement. Or, and this is your second um, prong, if you like, it is synthetic. And that means it is confirmable by empirical observation, for example, in a science lab doing an experiment. So in order for a statement to be seen as meaningful, it has to be verifiable. And it is verifiable if it is analytic and it's true by definition, a priori, or it is synthetic, that it is confirmable, it is testable by empirical observation. So this leads, obviously, to a 
quite narrow idea of what language is meaningful, doesn't it? Because scientific knowledge is therefore the only kind of meaningful, factual knowledge. And all traditional metaphysical doctrines, such as religious ideas, religious beliefs, statements in the Bible, for example, are rejected as meaningless. Because if you're saying a statement can only be meaningful if it's analytic or synthetic, that is very restrictive. You know, it obviously places great emphasis and great importance on the scientific method. And so we're going to talk about this as an example of epistemic imperialism, favouring empiricism over any other kind of knowledge. Um, and as I say, it leads to quite a very narrow view of what kind of language is meaningful and so should be taken seriously, because anything that's not analytic or synthetic is therefore discounted as meaningless. And this is the central rule. Um, which is contained in the verification principle, that there are two tests, if you like, there are two prongs. If it is analytic or synthetic, it is uh, verifiable and therefore it is meaningful. And so any statements that fail that test, any statements that are not analytic or synthetic um, in terms of it can then be confirmable by empirical observation, that is discounted as meaningless. Now, the irony of this, and this is a weakness of the verification principle, is that the principle itself cannot be um, verified. So, you know, we're going to be having a look at the problems with this as we look at our AO2 evaluation shortly. But just to confirm, the verification principle is therefore this two prong test that asks two questions of any statement in order to determine whether it is meaningful or meaningless. So in order for a statement to be meaningful, you have to be able to answer yes to one of these two questions. So number one, is it true by definition? So it's analytic. Or number two, is it verifiable? And obviously that means it's synthetic, that you are able to go and test and observe and see via your senses whether that statement is true or false. And any statement which fails the test, so it's not true by definition or it's not empirically verifiable, that would be seen as meaningless and so should not be taken seriously because it has no meaning. It would be dismissed as nonsensical and utterly irrelevant. So number one, is it true by definition? Number two, is it empirically verifiable? And if it is one of those two, then Air is happy to say, the logical positivist movement are happy to say that that statement is meaningful. But of course, our focus doing A-level RS is on the implication of this for religious statements. And it's not looking good, is it? Let's, let's be honest. Now, Air proposed to um, his readers that we should use a weaker version of the original verification principle. So it's important that he didn't just come up with the verification principle on his own. OK, remember, it developed out of that Vienna circle, out of the logical positivist movement. And as particular example, his particular approach to this is something called verification in principle. And we see that as the weaker form of the argument. So the one that we then associate with air is verification in principle. So the original version, the strong version, is called verification in practice. And that's the idea that a statement is only meaningful if there is direct sense experience, or obviously it's a tautology, to support the statement. So you would need to be able to say right here and right now that we can see it for ourselves. So that obviously is then extraordinarily narrow in terms of what kind of language is meaningful. If a statement is only meaningful, if there is direct sense experience to support it, or of course it's true by definition. So that is an extremely narrow version. And Ayer's version is called weaker because it, you know, it's more flexible. It's, um, you know, more adaptable, if you like, because it's saying that verification needs to be in principle. So this is when we know how a statement can, in principle, be tested empirically. So we don't need to do it right here and right now in order for that statement to be meaningful. Instead, we need to be able to say what we would do to test it. So it's in principle. So, for example, a statement such as there is intelligent life elsewhere in the galaxy. If you were using verification in practice, so if you were using the strong version of the principle, that is obviously going to be meaningless because you can't see right now that intelligent life 
in the galaxy, can you? You can't do that. But verification in principle would actually say that statement is meaningful because we know it could one day be possible to empirically verify this with sense experience. So, you know, we know that somebody could go up in a spaceship and actually see it for themselves. So verification in practice means that you have to be able to verify it right here and now, whereas verification in principle is about saying hypothetically we could verify it, we would be able to do it, for example, if we got in that spaceship. So obviously that is then more accommodating and it means that many more statements can be considered meaningful. So in terms of the verification principle then and this two-pronged test of meaningfulness, that it's got to be true by definition or empirically verifiable, what is the implication of this for religious language? For example, for a claim such as that God exists. And Eyre believed that such statements are neither true by definition, analytic, or empirically verifiable, synthetic, even in principle. So he was an atheist, remember? So he thought that when you die, you die. So unlike Hick, who is going to say, well, we could uh, um, empirically verify it after death, Eyre didn't believe there was any life after death. So for him, that verification would have to take place within this lifetime. And he believed that within this lifetime, we could find no empirical proof of a transcendent God. There is no proof of this. Consequently, he declares that the phrase God exists is literally meaningless and it can neither be true nor false. It is nonsense. So it's not even worth giving your time or attention to. Yeah. So it's meaningless. It's pointless. So he's not even saying that that claim is wrong. He's saying there's no point even considering the claim because it's meaningless, because it does not meet the uh, verification principles criteria. It is not true by definition um, and it is not empirically verifiable. There is no empirical proof of a transcendent God. There is nothing we could do in this lifetime to prove that. So the statement God exists is meaningless and it is nonsense. He's not going to give it any airtime. He's not going to give it any thought, any consideration whatsoever. So obviously you can see here that the verification principle is a big challenge to religious belief and religious statements, isn't it? And he said this himself, a great primary source extract here, that no sentence which purports or tries, attempts or claims to describe the nature of a transcendent God can possess any literal significance. So he's saying any language about God cannot possess any literal significance. And so just a question for you there, why would I argue that all religious language about God is meaningless? And what other types of language do you think would he therefore describe as meaningless as well? Because of course, it's not just religious statements that he's going to be saying are meaningless, but it's any statement that goes beyond um, tautology or that can be empirically verified. So, you know, claims about beauty and aesthetics, for example, are going to be dismissed as nonsense as well. Because as I say, you know, this verification principle is quite narrow in what it leads to us seeing as meaningful, because it has to meet that criteria. It has to answer those two questions. Is it true by definition? Is it empirically verifiable? And obviously for air, that statement that God exists or any statement about God, he would say is meaningless nonsense. So this is obviously a real challenge to religious language and to the meaningfulness of religious language. So as I say, religious language is dismissed as meaningless and is deemed nonsensical. And as well, and remember, we talk about air when we talk about metaethics. He's really important as an emotivist. It also means that ethical statements, which, of course, are very important within religions, are meaningless and simply expressions of emotion. So he does not believe that there is any objective goodness out there. There is no objective right or wrong, you know, and with natural moral law, for example, there is obviously objective right and wrong because natural moral law, according to Aquinas, is based on that eternal law at the top where God knows in his mind what is right and what is wrong. Whereas for air, he is saying any moral judgment, any moral statement is simply an expression of an emotion, of a personal feeling. I don't like killing. Stealing's not very nice. 
for example. So please remember the only language which is meaningful according to AIR is that which is analytic or synthetic in that it could be empirically verified in principle. Any other language is viewed as meaningless. And so, as I say, that is not just limited to religious language. You know, the statement itself, as I've said, is actually rendered meaningless. So let's just have a look at the strengths and the weaknesses, shall we, of AIR's verification principle. So our first strength is that it takes seriously the importance of empirical evidence. And, you know, we've touched on this already, but in the modern world, as Eyre himself said, people value ideas for which there is evidence. You know, science is our main source of knowledge today, isn't it? And the scientific method is grounded in empiricism. So we know very clearly, we can see very clearly, our society values empiricism. You know, we live in a world of what is described as epistemic imperialism. People use their senses, they use observations, not just in a science lab, but also in their everyday lives, in order to gain knowledge. That is seen as the number one way, as the reputable way, as the right way of gaining knowledge. And so the fact that the verification principle takes seriously the importance of empirical evidence, because of course it's all about empirically verifying your statements, it is seen as consistent with modern society. It is seen as supporting modern society, because if we're saying we won't believe something unless there is empirical evidence for it, then the verification principle is very helpful to us. And it's very consistent with our beliefs, isn't it? Because the principle, remember, is all about the idea that a statement has got to be true by definition or it's got to be empirically verifiable. So, you know, it's consistent with this modern belief in the importance of empirical evidence in order for claims to be believed and in order for a statement to be meaningful. We can also say, if we develop this even further, that verificationism fits with a scientific understanding of reality. And as I say, you know, if we think back since the Enlightenment period, you know, society has become more and more dependent on science and convinced that science is the correct approach to gaining knowledge. Because, you know, verification restricts meaning to whatever we have or that we can in principle have scientific evidence for. And that is, as I say, the number one source of knowledge today, isn't it? So this is helpful because it will ensure that we do not imagine we are talking about reality when we have no evidence to think that we are. So the verification principle is all about having evidence. It's got to be true by definition or it's got to be empirically verifiable. And that is consistent with our society's exaltation of science as our number one source of knowledge acquisition. We could also say it is consistent with the empirical ideas of John Locke and David Hume, who we've met already on the course, who argue that truth and knowledge are acquired via our senses. And this is something that there is a consensus on today, isn't there? The vast majority of people believe that we need evidence in order to believe something. They want to see evidence. If you tell them that, you know, you met a famous person, for example, they want to see a picture. They want to see the selfie you took with them. They want to see the evidence. People don't just want to believe things based on what you've told them. They want to see, and remember, sight is a form of empirical observation, it for themselves. So, you know, this approach, this principle is consistent with that contemporary exaltation of science and that contemporary belief in the importance of empiricism, which we describe as epistemic imperialism, the belief that one source of gaining knowledge is better than and more important than the rest. So the verification principle is grounded in the source of knowledge that people in the world today take seriously. Uh, and finally, as weaker version, which, of course, we know is verification in principle, means that we can still make statements about history and science, for example. You know, so we can say what would in principle um, show this to be either right or wrong. So we could say that the weaker version is better than the stronger version as it originally was. So, you know, that could be a strength in terms of, you know, the weaker version presented by air is more um, applicable it's more helpful than the original stronger version, although, of course, it is still restrictive. And um, the first weakness kind of links in with this because the verification principle is so restrictive that it actually fails its own test. So as I've put here as our first weakness, the verification principle fails its own test. 
because the, the principle itself is neither um, analytic, it's not true by, by definition that a statement is meaningful if it is true by definition or empirically verifiable, and it's not empirically verifiable. I can't go in a science lab and check whether statements are meaningful if they are tautologies or empirically verifiable. So the statement, not the statement, sorry, the principle fails its own test. And so by the principle's own criteria, the principle itself is meaningless. So that shows us how restrictive the verification principle is, you know, how narrow it is in terms of what can be considered meaningful, because the principle itself would deem itself meaningless. So why are you using the principle? If you believe that something is only meaningful, if it is true by definition or empirically verifiable, why are you using a principle which is not true by definition or empirically verifiable, even in practice? So you know, the statement, not the statement, I keep saying statement, excuse me, the principle fails its own test. So that is a pretty big problem, isn't it? And that is, I think, one of the best weaknesses that you can use. We could also say that the original version of the principle, so that strong version, verification in practice, has been criticised as too rigid and narrow. The idea that you need right here, right now, empirical evidence to support your statement, otherwise it's meaningless, that is seen as too rigid and narrow. It's too restrictive. You know, people believe actually that there are statements that should be seen as meaningful, even if they can't be immediately empirically verified. And for example, some scientific or universal statements may be rendered meaningless because they cannot be verified in practice so you know things that we do know are true could actually be categorized as meaningless by the stronger version of the principle because we can't empirically verify them right here right now but we still know them to be true so you know there's obviously limitations to the principle here that aren't just about the problems it presents for religion it can you know it can prove uh, scientific statements, for example, to be meaningless as well. So, you know, there are many more problems than the fact that it renders religious statements meaningless. Uh, obviously, we could say many philosophers believe that ethical, religious and aesthetic statements are meaningful, even if just to those who make them. So we'll be looking at language games and you'll be able to use language games to critique the verification principle later. Um, but we could say, you know, that actually, you can't just say that if a statement isn't true by definition or empirically verifiable, it's not meaningful. You know, that's too restrictive. You know, statements about God, for example, about ethics, about art and beauty, for example, can still be meaningful, even if just to those who have used them. So, you know, we're going to be making that argument, as I say, that this statement is the statement. I keep calling it a statement. I'm sorry. This principle is too restrictive and it is, you know, too limited. And then finally, and this is what we're going to look at in more detail now, Hick, John Hick, supports the verification principle. And remember, he is a theist. He does believe in God. But he argues that religious claims are verifiable. So he says that Eyre is being too limited in his approach. So even though Eyre's version is weaker, Hick would say it's not weak enough. You know, it's still too narrow because Hick believes that religious statements are verifiable after death. And so they are meaningful because they can be eschatologically verified that after death, you will be able to see whether there is a God or not. And he uses his parable of the celestial city to uh, argue this. So we're going to have a look at that now in a bit more detail. So there he is, John Hick, God bless him. And on the right is a little image of this parable, which we're going to have a look at together. So let's have a read, shall we? Two men, I want you to imagine it, are travelling together along a road. One of them believes that it leads to a celestial city. The other believes that it leads to nowhere. But since this is the only road there is, both of them must travel it. There is no other road to go down. Neither has been this way before, and therefore neither is able to say what they find or we will find around the next corner. Now, important to note here, in case you haven't guessed it already, that the celestial city represents heaven, that the traveller who believes that there is a city is the theist, and the traveller who believes there is not a city is the atheist. But of course, they're both on the same path which is life in this world. And neither of them have lived before. They're just on this journey through life. But one of them believes that they're going to a celestial city at the end, heaven. The other believes there is nothing there, that there's no, well, there's no city at the end. <laughs> now, 
during their journey, they meet um, with, sorry, let me read that again. During their journey, they meet both with moments of refreshment and delight and with moments of hardship and danger. So in life, we have happy moments, we have highs, but we also have difficult times. We have lows. All the time, one of them thinks of his journey as a pilgrimage to the celestial city, so that is the theist, and interprets the pleasant parts as encouragements and the obstacles as trials of his purpose and lessons in endurance. Prepared by the king of that city, obviously God in the case of heaven, and designed to make him a worthy citizen when he at last arrives. Now, you will remember, I hope, John Hicks' soul making the Odyssey. And I hope you can see it evident here in this parable. The idea that on life's journey, we face difficulties, we face channels, channels, challenges, but they exist for a really important purpose. They exist to strengthen us, to develop us, to prepare our souls for heaven so that we will be ready to enter heaven. So this is a brilliant link here in this paragraph to John Hicks' soul making the Odyssey. And that idea that theists believe that, you know, the challenges we face in life have a really important role to play, that suffering is instrumental in facilitating our growth and our moral development so that we can become worthy of entering heaven. The other, however, the atheist, believes none of this and sees their journey as an unavoidable and aimless ramble. So, you know, they just think they're here in the world. Let's just get through life. However, since he has no choice in the matter, he enjoys the good and endures the bad. And yet when they do turn the last corner, Hicks says, it will be apparent that one of them has been right all the time and the other wrong. So that last bit is very important, isn't it? Because that is the idea that when they die, they will find out whether there is a celestial city or there is not. Or, of course, in the case of a theist and an atheist, they will find out whether there is a heaven or whether there is not. So what is Hicks saying through this parable? Let's break it down. Obviously, the celestial city represents heaven. And the traveller who believes that they are going to the city is the theist who believes in heaven and in God. And then the traveller who believes that there is no celestial city but they've just got to get on with the journey anyway is the atheist who does not believe in god okay and hick is arguing here that religious statements are verifiable or indeed falsifiable after death so he believed that the original verification principle is too rigid and narrow and it's too quick to dismiss um religious statements because he thought that believing in god is a view and a commitment that influences everything in a person's life and it makes their life meaningful it is deeply meaningful and of course the example he gives there in the parable is when you experience good times in life but also when you experience life's challenges you know when they are faced with adversity with suffering and pain fear you know, turn to their religious beliefs, don't they, to give them comfort and reassurance because they believe that that suffering is part of God's plan. It serves a greater good. There's a higher purpose behind it. And that shows in Hicks' view that believing in God is very meaningful for a believer because it totally transforms their life. It totally transforms their worldview. There's a nice link to make there actually to Herr Blick and the idea of that religious lens that theists have and that they then interpret suffering as a catalyst for moral growth or as you know something that God has put in his plan for them in his test of them um but back to Hick for now he says that religious statements are meaningful because they will be verified after death and so he says because of the prospect of eschatological verification, religious statements can be considered meaningful when they are made during this lifetime. Because when you turn that final corner, when you die, you will be able to empirically verify and see for yourself whether there is a heaven or not. And so he said these statements have meaning for religious believers. Now, of course, Ayer's response is don't be so ridiculous. When you die, you die. You're not then going to verify something after death because your senses will no longer be working because they will stop working when you die. Your death is the end, the end of your senses. You can't then verify something after your senses have shut down. But for Hick, he said that actually, no, everybody will verify the religious statements and religious truth claims that have been made because they will see for themselves if there is a heaven or there is not. But obviously, as I say, Air would say you're wrong because your senses won't exist in order to verify anything at all. So this is John Hicks' response, and this is his way of defending the meaningfulness of religious language in the face of that challenge from verification. So 
Two critical questions for you. Obviously, critical analysis is key for securing our top marks in this A-level. So what do you think Air would make of Hick's eschatological verification? So obviously, if you were writing a paragraph about Hick and eschatological verification, it might be nice to add in there your critical analysis in terms of bringing in Air's response so that you wouldn't have your senses after death, so you wouldn't be able to empirically verify. So he is wrong. Um, and then number two, do you think eschatological verification? I can't speak. Some very big words today, guys. Please do bear with me. Do you think eschatological verification means religious language can be seen as meaningful? So do you think Hick is right? Has he managed to get one over air, so to speak? Or actually, is this all making no sense to you whatsoever? And you would agree with air that this is all absolute nonsense. So that's what you need to be thinking about. Uh, what we are going to do now, though, for the sake of time, is move on to the falsification principle. And the first person you need to know about when we're talking about falsification is this man here, Karl Popper. And he, first of all, proposed this principle as a way of demarcating science from non-science. So this was not originally about meaningfulness. And again, we are continuing with our key question of is religious language meaningful? But the falsification principle originally wasn't about determining if something is meaningful. So verification principle we know always was. It was about saying it's meaningful if it's verifiable. But for falsification, this was originally Popper's way of deciding whether a statement is scientific or not. Now, obviously, again, thinking about epistemic imperialism, this is very telling because now we associate if language is scientific with it being meaningful. And so, again, it's the idea that we have narrowed the kind of language we see as meaningful to a very, very small, select, exclusive club, which would have the word science on the door. Because effectively today, and again, it's this epistemic imperialism, this exaltation of empiricism, um, this idea is that language has to be scientific in order to be meaningful. And so the falsification principle in its original form for Popper suggested that for a theory to be considered scientific, it must be able to be tested and conceivably proven false. So you've got to be prepared to say what would prove my statement wrong. So, you know, if I said, you know, water will start bubbling when it reaches 10 degrees. If that was my statement, how could I, and I'd have to say it, how could I show that to be wrong? And the answer is, if my thermometer says that the water is 10 degrees and it's not bubbling. So that statement can be falsified, can't it? So it can therefore be seen as meaningful. It can be seen as scientific because I've been able to state what would prove my statement wrong. That is falsification. And the argument here is going to be that religious people, when they make claims about God, they're not prepared to say, OK, yeah, if there was this amount of suffering in the world, I would be prepared to say there is no God. That would prove to me that God is not all loving. And instead of doing that, instead of being prepared to falsify their belief in God, theists actually qualify. They go, well, there must be a, a purpose behind that suffering. Well, that suffering is not God's fault. It's the sake of humanity. Well, that suffering shows that, you know, the end of the world is near. So um, that leads to what Flew calls the death of God by a thousand qualifications, because a theist is not prepared to state this is what would make me stop believing in God. If X happened or if you showed me this, I would no longer believe in God. That's what falsification is, you know, being prepared to say what would prove your statement to be false. But a theist is never prepared to accept that there is no God. Instead, they will qualify their beliefs. They will shift the goalposts uh, and they will find an explanation. So this is what we're going to look at now. But for Popper, first of all, science should attempt to disprove a theory rather than attempt to continually support a hypothesis. So verification is obviously the positive approach in terms of you're looking for evidence, whereas falsification is that you're attempting to disprove. So this can be seen as an even stricter approach because you've got to disprove your own theory. And that really helps you check it's watertight, because if you've done everything you can to disprove your hypothesis and yet you've not been able to, that gives you more confidence in your hypothesis, doesn't it? Because I've thrown everything at it. I've given, you know, a hundred attempts to disprove it and I've still not disproven it. So then you're probably going to go, 
okay yeah okay it's probably true then i've done everything i can to disprove it and yet it's still true so you know this approach can be seen as more watertight in terms of you are attempting to disprove the theory rather than confirm it's correct so you should be trying to disprove your hypothesis rather than trying to confirm whether it is correct and that is seen as leading to a better quality a better standard of knowledge and information that you can trust and rely upon because you've ruled everything else out um, but of course, the implication of this for religion is not good because religious people tend to seek confirmation there is a God. They don't wake up in the morning and go, how can I disprove my belief in God? What evidence can I find that there is not a God? And then if I can't find any, I'll still not I still believe in God. Excuse me. You know, that is not how a theist operates or a theist thinks. You know, they do things to confirm their faith. You know, they go to church, you know, they read the Bible. They don't go out of their way to find reasons that God doesn't exist. So instantly you can see the big contradiction here between Popper and his belief you should attempt to disprove a theory rather than seek out confirmation of it. Um, and then obviously what religious people do. And as I say, they don't wake up in the morning and go, how can I disprove belief in God today? And so obviously religious statements and religious claims are going to be unfalsifiable. So Flew, Anthony Flew. Here he is again, another very smart man in his tie and his blazer. Um, he takes this further than Popper. So he is inspired by Popper. He builds upon Popper's work. But he goes on to say that it's not just unscientific, but it's actually meaningless. So if a statement cannot be falsified, it is not just unscientific. But actually, he said that if any statement fails the falsification principle, it is meaningless. So Verification and falsification ultimately aim to do the same thing, but in opposite ways. So verification seeks out confirmation, whether that is as a tautology or that something's empirically verifiable, whereas falsification seeks to disprove. You've got to be able to say what would disprove your statement or your claim, and that would make it meaningful. So they're aiming at the same thing to prove whether a statement or a claim is meaningful, but they're doing it in opposite ways. One of them, verification, is about confirming and seeking evidence, whereas falsification is about disproving as much as you possibly can. So here is the falsification principle in a nutshell. This is the definition that you'd get on your post-it note. And it's the idea that a statement is factually significant only if there is some form of evidence which could falsify it. So it's the idea that you must be able to say what would prove it to be incorrect. And again, the problem for religion and theists is that they are not able to say they are not prepared to say what would prove their belief in God to be incorrect, because rather than falsifying their beliefs and their statements about God being loving, for example, they qualify them. Ah, well, we don't fully understand God's love. Well, you know, God's love meant he gave us free will and then we misuse that free will and that causes the suffering in the world. So, you know, falsification is the idea you must be able to say what would prove it to be incorrect. And obviously for our theists, they don't want to do that. They want to shift the goalposts. They want to qualify rather than being prepared to falsify. So here is just a little question that summarizes what I've said there. Is this consistent, do you think, this tendency to falsify, to seek out, um, you know, evidence against your belief? Is this consistent with what theists try to do regarding God? Do they try to disprove God in order to check whether he exists? And the answer, of course, is no, they don't, do they? They don't wake up in the morning and go, how can I disprove this belief that I've been brought up with and that I believe so deeply and that gives so much meaning to my life? How can I disprove my belief in God? No, they're trying to show God that they have faith in him despite evidence. They're not trying to find evidence against him. You know, they're trying to please him and impress him and worship him. You know, worshipping God does not involve going out of your way to disprove that he exists. So religious language, religious claims are not falsifiable. For example, God is loving. God is the creator of the world because theists are always qualifying their beliefs about God. They shift the goalposts. And I'm going to show you what this means in a minute. And so religious language becomes meaningless. 
And that leads to, drum roll please, the death of God by a thousand qualifications, that you have chopped and changed your definition and your understanding of God so many times that you might as well no longer believe in God. And Flu uses the example of the invisible gardener to um, explain this point. But that is a key quote that you should be using in any essay on the falsification principle, that it leads to the death of God by a thousand qualifications. So let's unpack what this means. There are a or there is, sorry, a goalpost. And the idea here is that a theist um, is always qualifying their beliefs. So they're always shifting the goalposts. Um, and as I say, we're going to look at this. We're going to unpack this by reading Flew's parable of the invisible gardener. So it's story time again. Get yourself a cup of tea. Um, once upon a time, two explorers came upon a clearing in the jungle. I think that maybe should say garden, but never mind. Um, in the clearing, we're growing many flowers and many weeds. Oh, OK, here's the garden. Sorry. It's the garden within a jungle. I hope we're all keeping up. So one explorer says, some gardener must tend this plot. So one person thinks there is a gardener. So they've come across this garden in the jungle. Now we've established where it is. And they've um, seen it. And one of them said, there must be a gardener that looks after this. The other one disagrees and says there is no gardener. So they think, right, let's find out. Let's pitch our tents. Let's have a marshmallow. Let's have a hot chocolate and see what's happening and set watch, as it says there. Um, so as you can see, again, no spoilers. One of them is representing a theist who sees the world and says there is a God. The other one is representing the atheist who sees the world and says, there is no God. So the gardener is obviously going to represent God and the garden is the world. So no gardener is ever seen. So they're having the hot chocolate, they're toasting the marshmallows, um, they're enjoying the s'mores um, and they've not seen a gardener. So this is what the um, explorer who believes there is a gardener says. But perhaps he is an invisible gardener. So a bit like with God, we can't see God. So he's an invisible God. So they set up a barbed wire fence. OK, they electrify it. They patrol with bloodhounds. So with dogs that would sniff out any blood, any life. But no shrieks ever suggest that some intruder has received a shock. No movements of the wire ever betray an invisible climber. The bloodhounds never give cry. So effectively, no gardener has come or gone because all of the tests that they've set up to detect the gardener have not been activated. So no gardener has been found. Yet the believer, so the one who believes that there must be a gardener, is not convinced. So even though the barbed wire fence has been set up and electrified, even though the bloodhounds have been sniffing for blood and, you know, there's been nothing, nobody's been caught on the fence, the dogs haven't picked up the scent of a gardener, um, the believer who believes there is a gardener still believes there is one. He says, but there is a gardener who is invisible, intangible, insensible to electric shocks, a gardener who has no scent and makes no sound, a gardener who comes secretly to look after the garden which he loves. And at last the sceptic despairs, so the one who believes there is no gardener, and says, but what remains of your original assertion? Just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even from no gardener at all? So can you see what's happened there? So the believer has said, well, there is still a gardener, but that gardener we can't see, that gardener we can't smell, that gardener makes no sound, that gardener is secret. So we have no no evidence for that gardener. You know, that gardener's qualities are that they are invisible, intangible, insensible to electric shocks. You know, they are completely and utterly invisible. And the sceptic, the person who believes there is no gardener at all, says, well, what's the difference between this gardener you've just described and there being no gardener at all? Because you've shifted the goalpost, you've gone from there's a gardener to this gardener is now um, invisible, intangible, they make no sound, they come in secret. So you've qualified your belief of what the gardener is so much that why do you even believe there is a gardener? Because what is different from this overly qualified definition of the gardener and an imaginary gardener or even no gardener at all? 
So this is obviously the comparison with religion, that theists have qualified their beliefs about God so much. What is the point of believing in God? What is the difference between your qualified belief in a God who allows evil and suffering, who can't be seen, who doesn't interfere, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with belief in no God at all or an imaginary God? So let's unpack this. In this parable, obviously, the gardener stands for God. The garden represents the world. The flowers and the weeds stand for what the believers see as order and design in the universe. So the things growing in the garden, which is why they think there must be a gardener. The first explorer, the believer, represents your theist. And then your second explorer, the skeptic. Um, and obviously, a skeptic is someone who questions things and doubts things, represents those who are skeptical about God's existence. So, you know, it's an atheist, but it could also be someone who's agnostic, who's not sure. Now, by the tests of keeping watch, for example, electrifying the fence and using the dogs, the bloodhounds, the explorers are using their sense experience to detect the gardener. So it's an, uh, you know, an empirical inquiry, isn't it? But no empirical test shows that he is present. Now, that obviously leads to the skeptic to think, OK, so there is no gardener. I was right because I've said there's no gardener. I've tested that and the results are in as if it was an X Factor results show, and the results are there is no gardener. However, instead of accepting that there is no gardener, the believer instead qualifies what they mean by gardener. They change their definition and their understanding. They say, well, the gardener cannot be seen. So the believer says that he is invisible. Next, they add that the gardener cannot be touched. So the believer says that they are intangible. Then the gardener obviously cannot be discovered via sense experience. So the believer says that he is eternally elusive. By the end, there seems nothing to be left of that original assertion that there is a gardener, so that the assertion has been, Flew would say, killed by inches. And so for Flu, the gardener's existence um, or the gardener dies the death of a thousand qualifications because every time the believer fails to detect the gardener, they qualify what they mean by the gardener. And so the fact that you have chopped and changed your definition and your understanding so much kills off that belief. There is no connection between that original belief and the belief that you now have that you've modified and qualified so much. There's no point believing in that gardener that you now believe in uh, because of the death of God or the gardener in this case by a thousand qualifications. So obviously Flew's point is there is no gardener and in the same way there is no God because there is no empirical evidence of God that we have. So why do you believe in God? Why are you modifying your belief? Why are you qualifying your belief rather than actually accepting it's not correct? So as I say here, Flew's argument is that the believer in the garden will allow nothing to falsify his belief that there is a gardener who loves and looks after his garden. And in the same way, of course, the point is that the religious believer will allow nothing to falsify his belief that there is a God who loves and looks after the world. And so he says, and this is back to the falsification principle, statements about God are therefore meaningless. If you do not admit that there is no sort of evidence that could falsify your belief, then you might as well just believe anything that you like. So that believer in the garden, just believe what you want. Believe that there are unicorns, believe there are fairies, believe there are leprechauns in the garden as well. Because if you aren't prepared to say what would show your belief to be false, you might as well believe anything. And that is why that language would be called meaningless, because it has no substance. It has no authority. It has no credibility because you are just saying you will believe anything and you are not prepared to say what would falsify your belief. So whereas the sceptic obviously is happy to question and doubt, the believer is not allowing anything to falsify their belief. And so their language, their statements, their claims about God claims about the gardener are meaningless. So here it is in a nutshell, just to summarize it in bold, just to you know really emphasize this. If you are unable to falsify the claim you are making, for example, God exists or the gardener exists, and you cannot say what would disprove it, then the claim is unscientific. And so for flu, it is meaningless. OK, so if you are not prepared to falsify, if you're going to qualify instead, you're going to change the definition um, in response 
then it's unscientific and it's meaningless. It has no substance, it has no authority, and it is of no interest to Flew. So a couple of key quotes from Flew that he wrote in his uh, text on this. He said, in this parable, we can see how what starts as an assertion that something exists or that there is some analogy between certain complexes of phenomena may be reduced step by step to an altogether different status, to an expression, perhaps, of a picture preference. He says the skeptic says there is no gardener. The believer says there is a gardener, but an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener. He says a fine, brash hypothesis may thus though may so be killed by inches the death of a thousand qualifications and he says and in this it seems to me lies the peculiar danger the endemic evil of theological utterance so he's therefore saying that religious statements religious language is actually evil because it cannot be falsified because it leads to the death of a thousand qualifications because theists in their claims about god and religion are always qualifying rather than being prepared to falsify so he is not impressed with that he's not happy about that and and so he obviously dismisses religious language and religious statements as meaningless. And just to you know reiterate, scientists, remember, do not repeatedly qualify their hypotheses. You know, if they've got a hypothesis and then they've done a test and the hypothesis has been disproven, they don't change the hypothesis so that it actually can be proven. They say, OK, that hypothesis is wrong. They establish the hypothesis and then they test it empirically to see whether it is true or false. They do not, as I say, keep changing it to ensure that the hypothesis is always correct. Uh, so in other words, their language is falsifiable and therefore meaningful. And of course, in contrast, religious people modify it. God exists. Someone goes, what about the evil and suffering? And then they modify that. God exists uh, outside of the universe, so it's not his fault. Yeah. Or, you know, God is loving. And someone goes, well, what about evil and suffering? And they go, well, God's love meant he gave us free will. So they're not prepared to falsify. They are always qualifying. And this is the point here. What would have to occur or to have occurred to constitute for you to disprove or constitute for you disproof of, sorry, the love or the existence of God. So, you know, this is that question. What would give you confidence there is no God? You know, what evidence do you want to see? What evidence do you need to see that will lead to you saying, OK, there's no God? And the point is that for a theist, there is nothing. There is nothing that you could tell them that would falsify their belief in God. This is Blue's argument. They qualify rather than falsify. Now, if you think, if you are a theist watching and you think there is something that could falsify your belief in God, then please do comment it in the description box. It would be great to hear from you what that would be. I'm very interested in that, actually. Um, and Flu actually gives an example of a statement that he says cannot be falsified. God loves his children. So this is a great specific example that you could use in the exam. So Flu refers to a case where a child is dying of inoperable throat cancer. The child's earthly father is driven frantic in his efforts to help, whereas their heavenly father appears indifferent and reveals no obvious signs of concern because the child has got inoperable throat cancer. No miraculous cure has been thought come in. The parents are praying, but God hasn't done anything. And this is quite a common thing where people ask, well, where is God? God, don't they you know my child is suffering my child is dying why is God letting this happen God doesn't seem to care that's quite a common thing that people experience now rather than accepting this as evidence that the statement God loves his children is false because he's not doing anything to help this child dying of inoperable throat cancer the believer qualifies their statement by suggesting that God's love is not merely a human love or that it is an inscrutable love so God is loving but we just can't understand it so you know we, we can't expect God to save this child. Blue says, what would have to happen for a believer to say God does not love us or that God does not exist? And he says the fact there is nothing because a theist will continuously qualify their statements instead means that any statements about God, such as that God loves his children, are meaningless nonsense because it cannot be falsified because a theist is not prepared to say what would prove that to be wrong. They change their definitions. They shift their goalpost instead. And scientists, of course, in contrast, do not continuously qualify their hypothesis. As I say, it's more black and white. It's either true or false. Let's move on. Whereas for a theist, of course, they qualify rather than falsify. So 
What about our evaluation? If you need some AO2 for the falsification principle, what could you say? Let's start with our strengths, shall we? So falsification, again, like with verification, we can say is in accordance with science because it restricts meaning to whatever we have scientific evidence for, which reflects the emphasis on empiricism. So, of course, it's the idea of epistemic imperialism in 21st century life. So again, because it is grounded in the scientific method, of course, Popper originally used it to demarcate between science and non-science. It is in uh, sync. It is, you know, compatible with that contemporary attitude to how we acquire knowledge. It is consistent with belief in empiricism being our most reliable and most trusted source of knowledge acquisition, because, you know, we do use science, don't we, in order to establish the truth and to find things out. So that's the strength of it. A second one then is that it's actually better at doing that than the verification principle. So you could say it captures how science is done better than verification. And that is because scientists don't only look for verifications or, you know, things that will support their theories for their proof, their evidence. But they do try to test and disprove it, too, by looking for falsifications for it. So that you know, that habit of being prepared to falsify, you could say is a better approach than trying to verify because it's more in sync with what scientists do try to do in order to get watertight um, conclusions. And then finally, we can say it is a perfect test of whether a person's belief is about reality or not. Because if someone seems like they are just holding on to a belief because of faith without any reason, you can ask them what it would take for them to change their mind. You know, we see this in relationships, for example. You know, if somebody you think is in a toxic relationship and you say to them, what would it take for you to leave this person? And if they say there's nothing, you might be thinking, oh, God they've lost the plot yeah so it's this idea of checking whether someone is delusional or whether they you know they have their beliefs in reality and they have their mind thinking properly because if someone seems like they are just holding on to a belief because of faith without any reason you can ask them what it would take for them to change their mind and somebody with a rational belief based on evidence will be able to answer that question um you know, so it is about irrational and rational beliefs. And, you know, this is a great way of finding that out, you know, seeing what would it take for you to change your mind? And if they say there's nothing, then, you know, alarm bells are going to be ringing. If we look, however, at the weaknesses, um, obviously we use this one for the verification principle as well. But the verification principle itself cannot be falsified. It therefore fails its own criteria and it therefore would categorize itself as meaningless. So in the same way the verification principle couldn't be verified, the falsification principle cannot be falsified. What would it take for a falsificationist to believe that the falsification principle is wrong? What evidence would you need to see to know that this isn't the right way to find that language is meaningful? We can't do that. And so the principle fails its own test again. We could say, and this is our religion specific point, very important for our RS exam, that religious belief is actually falsifiable. So it's wrong to dismiss it just because it's not scientific as um, meaningless and as nonsense. Because St. Paul wrote, for example, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is pointless. So actually, was he a pioneer of falsification? Because he's saying if this hasn't happened, then there is no point believing in this religion. It is a load of nonsense. So actually, never mind Popper, was it St. Paul who was our pioneer of falsification? So it suggests Blue is incorrect to think religious language is always unfalsifiable. So that is a really interesting point. Um, our next point is a phrase I've used a few times, epistemic imperialism, the exaltation of empiricism. You could say it places too much emphasis on empiricism and on science and the scientific method and the use of science to discover knowledge. Why, you could ask, should a statement be seen as meaningless? meaningless just because it is unscientific you know is this not too narrow is this not too quick to dismiss Wittgenstein who we'll talk about next in his language games theory shows that statements can have meaning for those within a form of life even if they're not verifiable or falsifiable so 
it's seen as epistemic imperialism because you've selected one kind of knowledge and one method of acquiring knowledge, which is empiricism and the scientific method. And you've said, this is right. This is our test for meaning. But actually, is that not too narrow? You know, human beings in their fullness, in their diversity, you know, find meaning in many different areas, in aesthetics, in beauty, in religion, for example. And so, you know, it's too narrow in just fixating on um science and empiricism and you know society has become too fixated on them as our sources of knowledge and as our method of acquiring knowledge and finally of course um we've looked at feedism a few times now feedism is the religious belief in having faith alone so religious statements are meaningful for those who have faith they are true despite the fact that they cannot be verified or falsified so Feedism is the idea of having faith alone. You should not be seeking to prove your belief. You should certainly not be seeking to disprove your belief. You should simply have faith and God will reward you for taking that leap of faith. So for many religious people, you know, they don't believe that their religious claims need to be verified or falsified in order to be meaningful. They should actually be believed, you know, as a matter of faith. And that's what gives them meaning, having that deep faith. Now, this is a really great link to Hare and his idea of Blix, which is a response to falsification. So remember, our response to verification was John Hick and eschatological verification. And our response to um, falsification is Hare and his idea of Blix. So I want to just tell you what a blick is, and then we're going to have a look at how Hare believes this can explain religious belief, explain religious statements, and show that they are meaningful for those who have them. So a blick is, um, it's a bit like, you know how horses wear those blinkers when they're out in public? <laughs> that makes it sound like a celebrity going out wearing the Gucci sunglasses. Don't want to be papped, but you know what I mean? When horses are like, you know, being used by the police, for example, or, you know, in a parade for the royal family. Very niche examples I've just come up with there. Um, but blinkers that horses wear over their eyes. A blick is a lens. It's like a pair of glasses that you have just behind your eyes okay and it is a framework as i say of interpretation it is a lens through which you see the world so a blick is a world view it's your world view that you have okay so it's like the lens through which you see the world and then you interpret everything and you experience everything through that lens so it is logically prior to the facts in other words, you start out with a blick and your blick tells you how to interpret the world, what counts as a fact and what those facts mean. So your blick comes first. You've got your blick and then you experience the world and you experience it through that lens. So it is a way of seeing things. It is a framework for interpreting the world and it is non-cognitive. Blicks show how religious statements are meaningful, according to Hare. Now, something you may have studied if you've also studied psychology is schema. The idea that we do have this framework within our minds through which we see the world and that has been shaped by our upbringing by our childhood experiences by the things we've been taught by our parents that you know not we don't all see the world in the same way do we we all have our different perspectives on the world based on our upbringing for example, and this is the best example of Blix, a Christian sees the world in a different way to a Hindu. You know, we have a different framework of interpretation. We have a different lens through which we see the world. And that then affects how we make sense of the world that we see around us and, you know, what counts as a fact for us and what those facts mean. Now, Hare's example, we're on to our next parable now, is that of a lunatic. Now, it's important to note that Hare believes that blicks can be good, but they can also be bad. And he uses this parable to show us what a bad blick looks like and how it affects your life um, and how it is a non-cognitive thing. So let's have a look. Let's have a read. He said that a certain lunatic is convinced that all the dons, which is a word for university professors or lecturers at Oxford, wants to murder him. So he has got a blick that tells him that all dons want to murder him. And he's there with this lens, with this way of seeing the world. So that is the interpretation he has, that any Oxford University lecturer he meets at university wants to kill him. So that's the lens that he has. 
Now, he's there with his friends and they introduce him to all the nicest, the mildest and the most respectable dons that they can find who are really polite, who are really friendly to him. And they say, you see, he doesn't want to murder you. He spoke to you in the most cordial, kind manner. Surely you are convinced now that all of the dons don't want to kill you because the evidence I've just shown you, the person I've just presented to you is the nicest person in the world. They're really friendly. They've been really nice to you you clearly can see this person doesn't want to kill you. So your belief that you have that all the dons want to murder you is wrong. But the lunatic replies, yes, but that was only his diabolical cunning. He's really plotting against me the whole time, like the rest of them. So, well, you think he was being nice, but that was all an act. He's just pretending to be nice to me. He says, I uh, know it, I tell you. So however, many kindly dons are produced but the reaction he has is still the same. So he sees them and they're being really nice to him and the people who've introduced them, his friends are saying, look, this is evidence. This is clear evidence that they don't want to kill you, that they want to be nice to you. They want to be friendly with you. And he's turning around and saying, no, there's another explanation. That is not how it is. They must be putting this on. They must be faking it. This is a fabrication. And of course, her says, therefore, we can see that the lunatic is deluded. There is no behaviour by which the dons can show him that he is wrong about them. He will allow nothing to count against his theory that they are homicidal, that they are murderous. Nothing, and this is our key link to falsification, can falsify his belief about them. And so Hare explains this by saying the lunatic has a blick, which, as we know, is a view about the world. Um, and the blick he has is that all dons want to murder him. And that completely shapes how he interprets the world, doesn't it? You know, that is such a fixed, strong belief in his mind. That is the fixed lens that he has, that whenever he sees them, that's how he interprets it. Uh, and now this idea of a blick actually comes from Hume, who said that we cannot decide what the world is like by observing it, because all observation and evidence is open to interpretation. So rather, we have a blick, a view about the world, which may come from our upbringing, family or friends. In other words, what Hume is saying there is that nobody is neutral. Nobody sees the world exactly how it is. It's always through a lens. It's always through a framework. It's always through this idea of a blick. Now, here is what Hare teaches through his parable. He says that there are different kinds of blick. The lunatic's blick obviously is not a good one. It's an insane blick, which is going to damage him and hold him back in life, isn't it? Because he's never going to trust his teachers. So he's never going to go to them for help. And, you know, that might mean he doesn't do as well as he could at university. But that is a blick that he has. And that's come from somewhere. And that is now fixed in his mind. And that is the lens through which he is now seeing the world. He says, fortunately, most people, most of us, do actually have a sane blick. And he says that religious belief is a blick. So he says, religious beliefs, you can't see them as needing to be verified or falsified because they are something different. They are blicks. So they are not statements of fact. They are blicks. They are um, lenses. They are frameworks of interpretation that have deep meaning for those who have them. And so they are not claims about the world. They are a way of seeing the world. They are a lens through which someone sees the world and makes sense of the world. Now, a religious blick is a common and powerful view. And if I have one and I am sincere and believe in it, then no amount of persuasion from well-meaning philosophers such as Flew, will make me think differently. And that is what Flew has said, isn't it? But Flew's response was to therefore say, OK, then religious language is meaningless. But for her, his defence is that it's not meaningless because religion, religious belief is a blick. So Flew can't just treat religious statements as, um, you know, factual claims, cognitive claims that he can then say, well, it's not falsifiable, so it's not meaningful because actually religious belief is a blick. And so, you know, that belief and so the statements that it leads to is very meaningful for the person with it. And so, you know, as I say, Flu has to understand and he doesn't understand that religion is not just delusional denial, but it's a deeply held blick. So belief precedes observation. These blicks are deeply rooted and deeply held and they provide the lens through which we interpret the world. So they are very meaningful for those who have them, 
and therefore the statements that religious people make are very meaningful for them because they make sense for them because they're seeing the world through their blick. So let's have a look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of this response, shall we? So we could say that the analogy can be seen as successful. It works. You know, that analogy of the lunatic, you know, we can say, well, yeah, it does make sense that, you know, he's got that deep seated, that deeply rooted and deeply held view on Don's, you know, it's not going to nothing, sorry, is going to change his mind. It's not flexible. So we could say if the analogy works, then the argument that depends upon it works. We could say that it is good because it allows religious language to be meaningful, which makes sense of its influence on people's lives. It shows that religious language is meaningful for those with a religious blick. Um, and you shouldn't be talking about whether it can be verified or falsified, because even though it can't be falsified, it's actually non-cognitive. So you shouldn't be trying to falsify it. You've got to understand it in the context of a person having that deeply held belief, that deeply held blick, I should say. It is consistent with cognitive psychology. So a great link across to your psychology A level here. And the idea of schema, that each person has a mental framework through which they interpret the world around them. In terms of your weaknesses, however, if religious beliefs are blicks, then they're beyond facts, aren't they? They're non-cognitive. So this entire theory depends on an understanding of religious beliefs as non-cognitive. Um, and so there is no way of judging which one to follow other than personal preference in terms of religions. So that reduces religious belief to a personal preference, which you've been brought up with. And of course, theists don't believe that their religious claims are just a result of a lens through which they see the world. They believe they are saying something factually correct about the world. The key distinction here really is that Hare is saying that religious statements therefore are non-cognitive, whereas for most religious people they would see their religious beliefs as cognitive. They believe they're making a truth claim about the world. They don't believe they're just expressing something based on their blick that they have within their mind. But if someone else has a different blick, then they're not going to believe the same thing. When they make a statement about God, they're not saying, well, my God in my blick, in my bubble, is all loving. They're saying something they think that has more significance. Now, St. Paul wrote that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is pointless. So that suggests that religious statements can be falsified, that they are cognitive and they're not just blicks. And so Hare is wrong to then, you know, put religion and religious statements into the non-cognitive category because actually they can be um, falsified because Paul himself, as I say, beat Popper to it in wanting religions and religious statements falsified. And finally, if we bring in Richard Dawkins, he would ask, wouldn't he, well, what is the difference between a brick a brick, a blick even, excuse me, or brainwashing. Uh, Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion, criticised the teaching of religion to children as indoctrination. You know, he's very much against raising your child within religion because he says you are teaching them to believe in something for which there is no evidence whatsoever. So could Dawkins actually seize on this as evidence that religion is false um, and it is incorrect? There is no evidence for it whatsoever and it is the result of brainwashing. If people only have you know religious beliefs and only believe in religious statements because they've got a blick that you know shapes how they see the world does that not show how dangerous it is to raise children within a religion if you hadn't brought that child up within a religion they wouldn't have that blick so they wouldn't believe that there's a god and that wouldn't affect how they see the world and so for Dawkins that could be evidence that you know, religious belief is passed on via brainwashing. It's not something that rational people work out and decide for themselves. It shows very clearly that religious belief is the result of brainwashing. And that is demonstrated by the fact that a blick is shaped by your upbringing. And only people who have this blick believe there is a God. And that tells Dawkins that, you know, religious belief is not grounded in reality. It's actually, you know, brainwashed into you. Because remember, a blick is shaped by your upbringing, by your childhood experiences. So, you know, a really quite controversial point there, but I think a really strong argument to make in terms of, OK, well, if religion is now seen as non-cognitive and it is seen as, you know, this personal blick that you have that's been shaped by your upbringing, what does that tell us about whether there is actually a God or not or whether religious belief is just 
as I say, the result of brainwashing um, and, you know, indoctrination as a child. So, you know, let me know what you think of that point in the comments below as well. Always great to hear from you and any rebuttals that you might have for any of the evaluation points as well. Um, now, important, we need to just quickly compare flu and hair on religion. So obviously flu, Anthony Flu, our Mr. Falsification, believed that religious language is meaningless. OK, and that was as a result of his falsification principle. So he said religious statements are assertions about the world. So they are intended to be cognitive and factual. And so obviously he said, you know, I'm going to use my falsification principle to check whether they're meaningful. And he says that religious believers allow nothing to count against their cognitive slash factual assertions. And so religious statements are non-falsifiable and therefore meaningless. They die the death of a thousand qualifications. But of course, Hare's response, his defence and his way of arguing that no, religious language is still meaningful, is to say that flu is categorising these statements wrong. He's saying, no, they're not meant to be cognitive. For Hare, they are non-cognitive and they are non-factual. So he says, remember, religious statements are the result of blicks. A blick is not a cognitive or factual assertion. It is an interpretation of the world. And religious blicks are therefore non-cognitive and non-factual. So he's saying that you can't use your falsification principle to test religious statements because they're not cognitive. They are non-cognitive. So his defense of religious language and his way of saying it's still meaningful is to say that it's non-cognitive. Religious beliefs are non-falsifiable, but this is because they are non-cognitive. Nevertheless, and this is the important thing for her, they are deeply meaningful because they are deeply rooted and deeply held. The lunatic may have an insane blick, but this, um, or his refusal, sorry, to think differently about Oxford Dons shows the depth of that meaning for him. That has deep meaning for him because no evidence is going to change his mind. So that shows you how deeply rooted and deeply held it is. And so it has great and deep meaning for him. Now, instantly, your criticism should be, yes, but that blick doesn't help him. Yeah, that blick is not grounded in reality. So we can't say it's meaningful if it's blatantly holding him back in life and it's not supported by any factual evidence at all so you know be prepared and be ready to really critique these points that are being made here because for me that is a ridiculous argument it's meaningful how is it meaningful it's harming him because it's holding him back and it's not grounded in any evidence but then is that me showing my epistemic imperialism there you know myself um now, interestingly, here's Flew's criticism of Hare. He said, if Hare's religion really is a blick involving no cosmological assertions about the nature and activities of a supposed personal creator, then surely he is not a Christian at all. So Flew is saying there that uh, Christianity does seek to make cognitive claims. For example, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Surely they did intend that as a cognitive assertion. And so it does need to be subjected to the test of uh, verification and falsification and they would obviously you know show that it fails those tests and is meaningless um but he's saying if hair has reduced religion to being the result of a blick is that actually what religious people believe their religion is or do they believe when they're making religious statements that they are making universal truth claims that they are making cognitive factual statements um and Flew rejected Hare's view that religious statements are non-cognitive blicks because believers do see their statements about God as cognitive. So that is a key question as well when we're considering is religious language meaningful? Can it be considered meaningful? We have to also consider is it cognitive or not? When religious people make these claims about religion and about God, are they seeking to make um, cognitive statements or is it non-cognitive as Hare obviously would say? So Hare says it's non-cognitive, it's a blick, and that's his way of saying it's meaningful, whereas Flew says, you're wrong. I am going to get this tested using my falsification principle, and guess what? It's meaningless. So, you know, that is the debate, and you've got to be thinking about how would you conclude, you know, which side of the fence are you actually on here? Um, You know, are you going to back Flu, or are you going to support and champion Hare? Again, do you let me know who's right on this, do you think? Do you agree with Flu or do you agree with 
hair? Do let me know in the comments. But the final thing we're going to do today with Save the Very Best to Last is take a look at Ludwig Wittgenstein and his idea of language games. So Ludwig Wittgenstein, where do we start? Let's start with a couple of key quotes from him that I think it would be great for you to get onto a post-it note, actually. So he said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And that shows us, doesn't it, how humans are so dependent on language. Our world, our world views, our understanding of the world are completely shaped by language. So language is such an important tool for human beings, for communication, for comprehension, for navigating through life and making sense of the world. And he said, and this is his important rule, don't ask for the meaning, ask for the use. And that reflects his belief that you must always consider context when you're trying to decide on the meaningfulness of language. So Wittgenstein believed that the meaning of words is not or are not rigid and fixed. What is most important is how the word is used. So, you know, that first quote shows us that language is a tool for human beings. That second quote shows us that context is key. The meaning of a word is in its use. So you can't separate statements from their context. You can't take them out of context and critique them. They must always be fully understood within their original context. And so this use of language helps us to create our perspective on the world. So just a little question for you. When you look at this image, very famous image from Wittgenstein, what do you see first? So when you look at that image, what is the first thing that you see? Do you see a duck? Or do you see a rabbit? Um, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. But before we do that, I just want to talk to you um, about the idea of language games, because language games, I want you to think of it as if you were talking about sport. OK, so imagine you're a PE teacher and you're setting up different groups in your class to play different sports on the field. So you've got the footballers over here. You've got the rugby players over here. I mean, I know there's not going to be a swimming pool on the field, but let's just imagine, you know, big, big budget at the school, top school. We've got a nice swimming pool here. Put them in the pool and some people playing tennis over here. OK, so you have got your four groups playing sport and you're the PE teacher in the middle, you know, blowing your whistle, checking the time. How long is it till lunch? Shall I put my coat on? That kind of thing, you know, day in the life of a PE teacher. What? <laughs> Anyway, we're getting distracted. So what I want you to think about is, as you look around, what are the rules of each game? OK, so each game has its own rules, doesn't it? The footballers have got to play by a set of rules. The tennis players are playing by a different set of rules. There's different language for those rules, etc. I want you to think, can you use the rules of one of those games to play another? So could you tell the footballers, right, OK, I want you to Keep the rules, but I want you to go and play tennis. So the rules that you've just been using for football, use them to go and play tennis. Obviously not, because if they start kicking the tennis ball, you know, they're going to get disqualified. Um, and so you've got to think of it. And the reason I'm asking you this is for the different games, there are different rules. And the rules are unique to the game, aren't they? They are specific to that game. They cannot be transferred. So in order to play the game, in order for the game to have meaning for you, you've got to know the rules of the game and you've got to play those rules. But if you then blew your whistle and said, right, everybody move round, move on to the next activity, they would need to walk to the next activity, walk around the field, and they'd have to think, right, what are the rules of this game? I'm now doing rugby or I'm now doing tennis. I'm now doing swimming. What are the rules of this game? What do I need to know and what do I need to do in order to do well at this? And they would have to think of the different rules and they'd have to switch, wouldn't they? They'd have to, you know, then adapt to those new rules, leave the football rules behind and now play, play by the rules of rugby. You couldn't then start playing the rugby and, you know, start saying, well, you know, in football, this is the rule. Because people would look at you and go, well, we're doing rugby now. So you need to play by the rules of the rugby game, you know. And so that shows us, and this is important, that for Wittgenstein, in all the different areas of our life, which he calls our forms of life, there are different rules with unique um Sorry, there are different games with different rules and they are each unique context. 
And when we move through life, we move to different forms of life. So when you're at school, for example, when you go home, when you go to your part time job at the hotel, you are playing by different rules. You are in different forms of life and there are different rules that govern those social contexts and that give meaning to those contexts. So they are isolated, separate forms of life with their own rules. OK, and these are the different language games that we all play. Now, here's a really important question. Is one of the games right or are they all equally right for different people? So, you know, when you stand there as that PE teacher who set up four games, do you think the football is the right one? Do you think that is the right one? Clearly not, because you've got the students to do all four so the different games are all equally right they all have their own rules they all you know function as a cohesive whole you don't need tennis in order to play the football you don't need rugby in order to do the swimming so they're all self-sufficient self-contained contexts and they're all equally right they're all equally valid okay now these questions i hope are going to help you and this example of sports teams and different sports is going to help you i hope to understand language games so i want you to think of these different separate games which are all equally valid which all have their rules and you can't use the rules of one to critique another you can't use the rules of one to then play another. They have their own self-contained, self-sufficient rules, which give them meaning and which mean that the players find meaning in the game and that they understand the game. And as I say, they find the game filling and meaningful. So Wittgenstein, he argues that language use is like playing a game with rules, OK, within forms of life. So like those different sports, within different forms of life, different areas of our lives, in school, at home, at work, for example, we have agreed rules about how words are used. And Wittgenstein observes that religious language and the language of different religious groups are different language games. If we were to say that God allows suffering to develop our character and we will be rewarded in heaven, as John Hick would say, then this fits with the Christian language game. It has meaning for those who play that game. However, it does not fit with the atheistic or Buddhist language game, so it is not meaningful for them. So people who play the Christian language game, who operate within the Christian form of life, would find that statement very meaningful, wouldn't they? That is meaningful for them. That fits with their understanding of the world and it is consistent with their beliefs. But if you said that to an atheist who doesn't believe that there is a God, that is meaningless because they're going to say, well, there isn't a God in the first place. You know, I don't see the world as being created by God. And I don't believe that suffering has been used by God to help me go to heaven because I don't believe there's a heaven. So that statement has meaning for those within the Christian form of life who play the Christian language game. But for somebody in a different language game, for a Buddhist, for example, who believes in reincarnation and karma um, and samsara, then that makes no sense to them because it doesn't fit with the rules of their game. It doesn't align with their understanding of reality within that form of life, within the Buddhist form of life. And Wittgenstein argues that for the religious statement, there is not a difference of opinion where one viewpoint is right and one is wrong. He says meaning is subjective and it is subjective to your form of life and to your language game. So the rules, for example, are subjective. When that PE teacher stands in the middle of the field and there are four games going on, the rules are subjective to each of the four sports. There is not one set of rules for all the sports. In the same way, meaning cannot be established objectively. Meaning is subjective to each uh, form of life and to each language game. And so, of course, this leads to the question of truth. And for Wittgenstein, this is a question that is unresolved. There are many equally valid truths. There are many simultaneous truths in the same way that we said all four of those games, all four of those sports are equally right. There isn't one sport that's right. Uh, there are many truths. So, you know, each statement has meaning within context. You can't take it out of context and say, right, objectively, God allows suffering to develop our character. True or false? That statement has to be understood within that form of life 
within that language game. It has meaning for those who play the game and who operate within that theistic form of life. Religious statements are meaningful, as I've just said, to those within the theistic language game. And here's the important point. Those outside of that language game should not seek to critique language within it. So the rules of football are meaningful for those who are playing football. Um, but somebody who's been doing the rugby should not march over to the football and say, that's wrong. Those rules are wrong because they're not an expert. They're not part of that language game. They're not operating within that form of life. If they moved over to that form of life, they would have to immerse themselves in the rules of that game. They couldn't use the rules of rugby to go and critique the football match, okay? So that is really important that anybody outside of a language game, outside of a form of life, should not seek to critique language within it, okay? Everything is subjective. Everything is relative to the game, to the form of life. So just to emphasize what a form of life actually is, this is used by Wittgenstein to denote the habitual activities and responses which form the background to any use of language. So for example, Christianity is a form of life. And as I say, you know, going to school is a form of life where there are certain ways language is used, you know, um, and, you know, being at work, being in a certain job is going to be a form of life where, again, words are going to be used in a certain way that have a meaning that is dependent on that context. For example, in a hotel. Now, the emphasis um, shifts from thinking of language as this objective system of signs to focusing on seeing language as the activities of agents who do things with their language. Remember, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. It is a tool for people to exist, to communicate, to operate. Language has, and this is important, a unique meaning and significance for those who belong to the form of life and therefore play the rules of that game. People belong, as I said, to multiple different forms of life. They continuously move between these different forms of life, playing by the rules of each respective language game. So it's a bit like McGrath said about the non-overlapping magisteria. When you're talking about science, you need to play by the rules of science. And then when you go over to religion, you need to play by the rules of religion. They're separate, doing separate things. Things. He believed that science explains how the world came into existence, religion explains why, but you can't use the rules of the religious language game to go and critique the scientific language game and vice versa. Yeah, so they are independent, they are self-contained, they are self-sufficient and you cannot use the rules of another form of life or language game to critique another from the outside. So that is obviously saying that religious statements have meaning for religious people who belong to the Christian form of life and who are playing by the rules of the theistic language game. Okay, and I just want to go back to do excuse me, this image here, I have not forgotten it because this is a famous um, image, as I say, from Wittgenstein, which is asking you, what is the first thing that you see? Is it a duck or is it a hare? Is it a rabbit? And this is Wittgenstein's point that meaning and everything is subjective. Some people will look at that single image and see a duck first of all some people will look at that and they'll see a hare a rabbit first of all and that's his point that meaning is subjective there is not one truth there are many okay and that is obviously going to show that religious statements are meaningful for those operating within the theistic form of life within the theistic language game so that brings me on to the first strength of language games, because um, this defends religious language from the challenges of verification and falsification. So obviously we've looked at Hicks defense and we've also looked at uh, Hare's defense. Now we're looking at Wittgenstein's defense and Wittgenstein recognizes that religious and scientific statements are two different types of things that deserve to be treated differently. So it's like your football game and your tennis match. They are different things that need to be treated differently. They have different rules. Religion is a matter of faith, a totally separate language game to science. And of course, as I say, a great link to Alistair McGrath and his idea of the non-overlapping magisteria. Religious statements do have meaning for theists, for those who belong to the Christian form of life and who play by the rules of the theistic language game. It also, a second strength, demonstrates how religious language has meaning for those who use it within their religious language game. And of course, that reflects reality, doesn't it? 
religious people do believe that when they're in church, for example, when they're praying, when they're talking about their religion, that their assertions do have meaning, even if those outside of the game do not. It has meaning for them. And that is encapsulated by Wittgenstein's view that meaning is subjective, that for somebody within a form of life playing by the rules of a language game, a statement does have meaning. So even if other people don't see it as meaningful, for that person within that form of life, within that language game, it does have meaning. And that's captured by language games in the same way, you know, that the, the rules of the different sports have meaning for those playing the sport. Even if you're not bothered at all about hockey, for example, somebody who is bothered about hockey, who does play hockey and does know the rules of hockey is going to find that very meaningful for them and those rules are going to be important for them of course another link is to religious pluralism which is a key topic on the christianity paper because it shows that all religions are equally valid in the same way that those four different sports are equally valid all religions are equally valid you know we don't have to pick one that is right we don't have to say objectively what is meaningful meaning is subjective and of course we can say that that promotes respect and pluralism and then finally we can say actually this captures the way that social life works we can see that different social settings have different rules for example in a job interview you're going to act and speak in a very different way to if you're playing football for example or you know when you're at the party Park with your friends you're going to speak and act in a very different way to if you're at dinner with your grandparents for example and um religious language um can actually link very nicely here with english language there are english language um scholars who have come up with a word called code switching the idea that in different contexts in different social contexts we code switch we change our way of speaking to fit the context and this you know, shows us that Wittgenstein is correct. We do change. We are little chameleons, aren't we? When we're in different situations, we adapt and we change to different social situations, reflecting the fact that there are different rules governing different areas of our lives and that we have to fit them. You know, if you're on the beach, you're not going to be wearing the suit, tie and blazer that you wore for a job interview are you you know and again that shows us there are different rules and conventions in different areas of our lives so that demonstrates the realness if you like of Wittgenstein's theory of us having these different forms of life within which we play different language games and so language has meaning within that form of life for those who are playing that language game however if we look at the weaknesses so you know continuing with our AO2 let's have a look at the problems Language games can be said to lead to what's called theological anti-realism. So when someone says that God exists, they don't just mean within their form of life. They don't just mean within my form of life, within this language game, I think that God exists. And that's just a rule of our game. But if you play a different game, that's fine. You know, people who believe in God believe that there is a God out there. So they believe basically that that is objective. They believe God exists objectively. They don't believe, well, God exists within our language game, within our form of life, there is a God. When they say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, they mean he literally did that. They don't mean, well, that's our belief within our little language game, but other people disagree. So you could say that that is a weakness because it makes religious claims, religious statements, subjective truths it makes them non-cognitive of course and it makes them subjective truths um and that leads to theological anti-realism whereas as i say theists usually believe there is a god they do believe there is a god it's not just something they believe within their language game we could also say that he's actually separated the forms of life too much and that, for example, scientific and religious meaning could actually be linked. So Wittgenstein did see them as radically different, didn't he? He said, you've got your scientific language game over here and you've got your religious language game over here. But could they actually overlap? Could they actually be much more connected than Wittgenstein has acknowledged? So we could say, you know, there is actually too much distinction made by Wittgenstein between the forms of life. So it's not quite clear how much they overlap. Surely the rules aren't completely different. So, you know, there is a question of how those forms of life interact. He says they don't at all. They're completely separate. But 
some people may think John Polkinghorn, for example, who was a religious scientist, um, would say, you know, the, there's a much more interrelated relationship there. It could also suggest that interfaith dialogue is futile. It's pointless because you wouldn't be able to understand each other's rules. You know, a big thing with interfaith dialogue is about finding common ground, isn't it? It's about saying, right, what do we agree on? Let's find common ground. You know, let's work together. Let's cooperate. But actually, Wittgenstein is saying here, there's no point because you're completely different. You are playing completely different language games. You are completely different forms of life. There is no way for you to work together because you're never going to understand each other's rules, which is obviously good because it promotes pluralism and stops you telling other religions they're wrong because you think, well, it's not my place to do that. But then the flip side, the other side of the coin, is that it means you can't then work together. So it means you can coexist, but it prevents working together, you could say, because you would not be able to understand each other's rules. It's like hearing a language that you completely don't understand at all and you never could so you know that's the problem here really that on the one hand it's great because it promotes equality and pluralism but that then prevents working together based on the fact that he's saying you wouldn't be able to understand each other's rules which as I say is great because it means you can't critique others but then it stops you working with them and then finally and importantly Dividing up human social life into different language games could become very messy, couldn't it? So, for example, are there games within games? You know, so we've said that the football form of life, but then is it a different form of life for each team, for example? And then for each person within the team, uh, does every single religious believer, if we apply it to religion, operate within their own language game within the religious language game? So, you know, within the Christian form of life, do we then have two three billion individual language games that different christians are playing because of course they've all got their own interpretation of the religion haven't they they've all got their own perspective on the faith and so we could say language games makes religion too individualistic and it could end up getting very messy bordering on absurd if we're then saying everyone has their own um language game so it makes belief too subjective and it makes religion too individualistic so actually and again, it's quite like the death of God by a thousand qualifications, I think. You know, what do you actually therefore believe in? If everybody's then got their own personal understanding of God and nobody else can critique their understanding of God because they're outside of their language game, what's the point of believing in God at all? Can we not just say everyone has their own imaginary God, their own imaginary friend in the head? You know, if nobody can then critique it and nobody can then clarify which one is correct, do we not end up in a bit of absurd of an absurd position where everyone's just got their own version of God and there's 8 billion different beliefs about God and nobody can critique anybody else's. So we've all just got our own one that we personally believe in, if that makes sense. So, you know, we have to think of the implications of where this could end up going and what the implications are. And again, that question, is religious language cognitive or non-cognitive? When a theist makes that claim, are they saying for them in their personal Christian language game, which no one else can critique, which is equally right for everyone else's, or do they believe it objectively? Because if my understanding of God is completely different from yours, yeah, OK, we can then say, well, you know, we're not going to critique each other because we're playing different games. But surely we therefore don't agree with each other because we're saying something really different. So, you know, again, it's that theological anti-realism and it is that question of reducing religion to being far too subjective and too individualistic. And we could say that's not in accordance with that idea of having universal religious doctrines and, you know, the idea that when religious people do make a claim about God or make a statement about God's nature, they do believe that to be objectively true, not just a personal thing within their private personal language game. So let's have a look, shall we, uh, to bring all of this together at the implications of the verification principle, falsification principle and language games for religious language. So, you know, obviously our key focus is on that question. Is religious language meaningful or meaningless? So. For the verification principle, of course, religious language is going to end up being dismissed as meaningless because it does not meet the criteria for verification. It is not analytic. It's not true by definition. It is not synthetic. It cannot be empirically verified, even in practice, 
within this lifetime. Religious discussion is therefore seen as meaningless. The result is that religion is not taken seriously as a worldview. So it is excluded. It's seen as nonsense. It's not seen as worthy of airtime. And I suppose we do see that if you turn on the news today, you know, we don't get religious experts commenting on world affairs, do we? You know, we, we hear about scientific breakthroughs. We have, you know, medical experts, etc. cetera. Um, so we can see that, you know, religion has sort of been pushed to the peripheries because people don't think it's meaningful. It doesn't have anything meaningful meaningful to contribute because it doesn't meet our modern contemporary criteria for verification. Um, however, of course, Hicks eschatological verification does seek to show how religious language can be meaningful. So that could be your reconciliation, if you like, if you wanted to argue religious language can be uh, meaningful in accordance with the VP uh, by saying that Hicks eschatological uh, amendment does make that possible. If we think about falsification, then again, it is going to dismiss religious language as meaningless because religious believers will not falsify their beliefs. Instead, they move the goalposts and qualify them. You know, think of the parable of the gardener. They chop and change their definitions, leading to the death of God by a thousand qualifications. Of course, Hair's blix is the response there. It's saying that um, flu is wrong to categorise religious language as cognitive. It's actually non-cognitive. Um, and he seeks to show that religious language is deeply meaningful for those who have a religious blick. But, you know, religious statements are non-cognitive because of this idea of blix. And that leads us on quite nicely to language games, Wittgenstein. Religious language is meaningful for those who belong to a religious form of life and play a religious language game. The meaningfulness of language must be understood in context so you know the meaning of those statements can only be understood within that context within that form of life and within that language game and of course the problem with that is that it leads to uh, religious anti-realism theological anti-realism and suggests that religious statements only have meaning for those who use them and for a theist of course they would say they're more than that they think they're making a claim about the universe uh, and not just expressing a view in accordance with their personal form of life that fits with their rules of their language game so I hope that's been helpful. Um, to conclude today, I just wanted to share with you a potential AQA question, if you are doing the AQA spec. And the statement could say, religious language is meaningful. And this would be a brilliant question to get, uh, to evaluate this statement, because you could draw upon all of the uh, things we've talked about today. You could draw upon the verification principle, the falsification principle and language games. So here was my idea of how we could plan this. If you were looking to plan this and potentially write it, um, you could start obviously with your agree points being that the verification principle, AJR, and the falsification principle, Anthony Flew, show that it is meaningless because it fails to meet the criteria. But then, of course, if you wanted to bring in your disagree points and you need to give both sides of the argument, you could use eschatological verification. You could use language games showing that religious language is meaningful for those who belong to a theistic form of life and play by the rules of that language game. And of course, you could use Blick, um, Hare's idea of the Blick, um, and you could make that point that it is deeply meaningful to those who have a religious Blick because that blick is deeply rooted and deeply held um, and reflecting there, of course, on the non-cognitive nature of religious language. But remember, with your evaluation answers, and this goes for AQA or OCR, please make sure you've got that thesis statement at the start. You've got really strong arguments throughout the main body of your essay. You're naming scholars, you're linking back to the question, you're explaining with evidence, etc. And then always conclude with your strong conclusion, which uh, reaffirms your thesis and shows the examiner that you have considered the statement and you've reached that justified conclusion at the end. So thank you for joining me. I hope that's been helpful. Good luck with your studies and I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.